Thank you and welcome to the participants who are joining us. We'll get started in a minute. Okay, I see that our participant numbers are going up. And so this means that the webinar is live and working and you can see us. Um, so thank you, a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us for the launch of this exciting, vital new book from Professor Mark Harvey. I am sure that Mark really, for most of you who are joining us today, needs little introduction. Professor Harvey is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Essex, and he is the founding director of the Center for Research in Economic Sociology and Innovation, or CRESI, which is jointly hosting this event together with the British Sociological Association's Climate Change Group, also with hosting support from Essex's Department of History. So a very warm welcome to Mark and to all of the panelists. Mark, as you know, has developed a, a extensive comparative and historical approach to economic sociology across many fields. And his latest book has been called A Landmark Contribution by Chris Hahn and, and Jamie Peck, based at the University of British Columbia, who will be known to many of you, has also pointed out that this book establishes a new benchmark and provides new tools for the critical social scientific study of global climate change. So it could not be a more timely, time to have this event than tonight at the launch of COP26. And I will turn over to Professor Harvey in a minute, but just to give a bit of an overview about how the seminar will run. Professor Harvey will speak for about 20 minutes, and then each of my esteemed guests, the panelists will speak for about five minutes each, five, five minutes each after Mark's talk, and then we will turn to a Q&A. So as Mark and the other panelists are speaking, feel free to start accumulating your questions, putting them in the chat, and then we will turn to them after the talks. We are joined tonight by two guests from the Department of Sociology, Katie Wheeler and Nigel South, as well as Jeremy Crickler from the Department of History. So thank you, a warm welcome to you all, and I'll turn now to Mark, who will speak for about 20 minutes. Thanks, Mark, over to you. Thank you and, and welcome to you all and thanks very much Lindsay for that very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to uh, um, talk for about 20 minutes and I, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the book here that, that appeared just recently. Um, in, in time for COP26. And uh, in this particular uh, occasion, I'm going to really concentrate on some of the more conceptual aspects of this idea of sociogenic climate change. Um, so uh, what do I mean by sociogenesis and, and how does it contrast with anthropogenesis? Well, anthropogenesis is really a natural scientific uh, uh, to, uh, conception and I have absolutely no quarrel with it at all. In fact, it's um, it, it, they're very clear themselves about what they're doing and what they're not doing, natural science, scientists. They're looking at the aggregate human impact of any human uh, activity, and uh, they're just looking at it in terms of the impacts which they measure in terms of sea temperature, in terms of uh, carbon dioxide per, per, per million in the, in the atmosphere, ice flows and ice, ice melts and so on. In a way, to, to the natural science, it doesn't matter whether, uh, whether a cow farts in Brazil or Australia. And it doesn't matter whether a, a, an airplane flies a thousand miles in this direction or that. And perhaps even more significantly from our point of view, it doesn't matter whether one person emits 100 ton tons of CO2 equivalent, or whether 100 people uh, emit one ton of uh, CO2 equivalent. But for the social scientist, uh, it does matter absolutely who emits CO2 and uh, associated gases, where, when, and how. And the concept of sociogenesis then is about this, the, these processes involved in the generation, the generation of, of, of climate change. And it's a very broad term. 
intended to encompass both pre-industrial pe uh, periods, but also uh, the uh, period of the Industrial Revolution, including afterwards uh, the, the, the significant period of uh, the Soviet Union or contemporary market socialism in, in China. And what I'm going to do in this, in this talk briefly is to deal with some of the kind of key elements to this concept of sociogenesis. I'm going to look at about how societies are cited within their resource environments, different historical trajectories, including the great divergence, which occurred during the period of the real acceleration of climate change, the Industrial Revolution. I look at three waves of accelerated climate change. And then I turn my attention to what is perhaps the key, one of the key aspects which are affecting COP26, COP26, namely inequalities of wealth within and between countries, and then inequalities of environmental resources, I mean, uh, which I shall come to uh, immediately. And finally, I'll wind up by thinking, what is the significance of, of the sociogenic challenge to, uh, to COP26? So my first move really is what I think of as almost a kind of paradigm change for, for social science uh, and indeed history. Um, very often uh, I, I, I take a lot of my inspiration from Karl Planyi and he had an idea of how the economy was embedded in, or embedded in society or later instituted in society, what, how the economy related to culture, law, polity and so on. He did have a clear idea that if markets were unregulated, they could destroy a nature and the natural environment. But really for him, nature was a kind of externality, it was something outside of, outside of society. And what I, am, what I do in my approach is really turn, turn the whole lens the, the, uh, the other way around and say that in, instead of looking at um, nature's external to society, I'm looking at how society is internal to the resource environment over which it has control, either by direct, direct territorial control or through colonization and trade. And I think we can only be too clear as we run up to COP26, how significant it is, what the resource environment of a given society is. Where is the coal? Where is the oil? And we have been reminded very clearly in the last few weeks, where is the gas? So it becomes absolutely essential to, uh, to understand how societies are cited within particular and have control over particular resource environments in order to understand uh, climate change. And now I'm going to go into the great divergence where there are different historical trajectories. And I, I'm really only give you, going to give you absolutely limited snapshots uh, of, of time in what are really quite complicated and long running history. So 1850, the United Kingdom was burning three and a half times more coal than the whole of France, Germany and Belgium as a result of leading what uh, an industrial revolution and its premier industry was, uh, the, was uh, uh, the textile industry which was now steam powered burning coal on an unprecedented historical uh, at an unprecedented historical level and much attention has been paid to this side of what was happening in terms of the industrial revolution but my argument is that equally important was the fact that these factories depended on cotton which was being produced in the united states and that in turn involved, first of all, the genocides and ethnic cleansing of Native Americans. Secondly, the implantation of plantation economies of cotton to such an extent that the United Kingdom effectively owned 70% of the slave cotton crop of the United States. And indeed, the London Times in 1857 <laughs> ironically said that England could be regarded as one of the states of the United States. Such was their integration with the uh, slave plantation system in, 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 uh, in, in the deep south in, in the production of the, of, of textile, uh, of the textile uh, in, in British factories. So it was neither coal nor cotton and land clearance that was involved, but a combination of industrialization on the one hand and agricultural 
extension and intensification on the, uh, on the other. It was the combination of these two things which were responsible for that massive acceleration in climate change at that point. Changing to turning to a very different trajectory in the United States, I, I looked at the uh, at Texas. Now, Texas, as uh, uh, what is really distinctive about uh, the settler colonialism and the transformation of the whole continent of North America, was again this very rapid displacement of what had been uh, subsistence and uh, and uh, hunter gatherer societies of the of the Native Americans through genocides and ethnic cleansing and its replacement by a very different, very different economies. And, and I concentrate here on, uh, in Texas, which was also indeed a, a, a cotton, slave cotton producing uh, state, the transformation of, the, uh, of going from wild bison to commercial Texas long, longhorns. This led to these very famous uh, ca uh, cattle trails the Chisholm Trail and the railways which connected them. And so within two decades of, uh, of its being, uh, becoming a full member of the United States, 5.7 million Longhorn cattle went to Chicago. And, and in 1865, Chicago boasted to be the bovine capital of the world. And what was involved here was the formation of a meat eating culture, which has endured to the extent that today, US is, a, is a, a country of the foremost meat eaters in the world. They, they consume, roughly speaking, 50% more meat per capita than the average Euro, Euro, European. So these are two really, really short snapshots of complicated histories and it, in, involving this idea of industrialization and agricultural extensification and intensification. And they were followed by two further waves of accelerated climate change, the powering up of societies with electricity on the one hand and the motorizing of societies through the combustion engine. And in both cases, uh, there are huge societal variations depending on the resource environments in which the societies were developing. It's also very important to, uh, to stress that this was often driven not so much by market forces, but by major strategic state action. And the consequence of that now is huge variety in the way that electricity is generated in the contemporary world. So Brazil stands out by having virtually a, a minimal amount of fossil energy for generating industrial and domestic power. 63% are hydro. France, 78% nuclear. And then by contrast, you have India and China that are 70% dependent on coal or Saudi Arabia and Russia, 50% on gas. So massive, in terms of climate change, massive differences in the way different societies are generating climate change through their uh, electrification. And a similar story is, is, uh, is the case in the motorizing uh, of, of societies, which really took off on a really massive scale post Second World War. So it was at that time that we saw the huge construction of motorway systems. The interstate highway system in the US was the biggest engineering project in history almost. And, and similarly with motorways and autobahns in, in, in Europe. And Bob Dylan uh, did a, a commercial for Chrysler Motors in which he claimed that US, in the US, it was cars that made America. It sounds rather Trumpish to me, but nonetheless, it was a, a, a a lyric uh, of, of Bob Dylan's. And, the, and in a way, he's absolutely right. So in the US, there are 800 cars per thousand people. In, in the UK, it's down to 518. And in China, only 188. So you can see that there is a huge difference in car cultures in these different, in these different societies. And that's, that's ramified by the fact that in the US, the cars are 30% than cars even in Germany. And as a consequence of that, the average U US citizen burns four times more petrol per capita per year than, than the average European. And finally, the craze over SUVs, which has swept around the world, again, still reflecting this big difference between the US and elsewhere, has resulted in additional petrol on top of normal cars, which is, which is uh, uh, which is equal to 
the amount of that would be reduced by 150 million uh, it cancels out what would be uh, w the the benefit of having 150 million electric cars so they are these are huge sociogenic uh, processes at stake okay so what I've been talking about now are these processes of very different from country to country uh, development of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of their economies and the way in which that has accelerated climate change. So now I'm looking about how that is then manifest in these huge inequalities of wealth between the countries which developed further and fastest and then the wealth within those countries. Now this, is, this graph is a very crude graph. The statistics are are very rough and ready, but it shows there is a very broad but significant correlation between the amount of GDP per capita, the amount of wealth of market wealth that's produced on the one hand, and the CO2 emissions per capita. So the biggest, the wealthiest per capita production is closely aligned with the wealthiest with the, with the, with the amount of CO2 per capita. But then this is actually revealed much more effectively when one looks at inequalities within countries. And to my mind, some of these figures are really pretty staggering. So the top 10% in the US earn, roughly speaking, twice the amount in, in dollar equivalents of the top 10% of earners in the UK. And as a consequence of that, they produce 50 tons of CO2 equivalent compared with the 24 tons per, uh, uh, per capita equivalent that's produced by the top 10% in, in, uh, in, in the UK. But it's in, in both cases, it's the richest within the richest countries, which are the leading agents of, of, of climate change. And it's worth remarking that in order to achieve the 1.5 degree centigrade target, the global average per capita must only be 2.4 tons of, of CO2 equivalent, which means that the US top 10% are in fact generating 20 times more CO2 than would be necessary to meet the 1.5 degree, uh, degree centigrade. And the converse of that is that the bottom 50% of the world's population, 3.5 billion people, are, are producing only 10% of, of global emissions. And these are staggering inequalities to, to my mind and really shows what the importance of a sociogenic understanding of it is in terms of how it really does matter whether one person is producing 100 tons and not 100 people producing one ton. This is really where inequalities of wealth and inequalities of, of, uh, of climate change are, are most significant. So in a survey of 86 countries, this is reflected in the fact that the top 10% in all of those countries together consumed 187 times more vehicle fuel and 13 times more heating and electricity than the bottom 10%. And that has been the attention of quite a lot of the, of the kind of understanding of, of what is really uh, uh, um, involved in, in climate change. But the, given my original stress on the fact that it's very important where societies, what resource environment uh, 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 societies are cited in and develop in. I'm now wanting to stress the significance of their inequalities of environmental resources. So um, the Amazon deforestation that has occurred over the last several decades has, has been fueling across the world the meat transition. Brazil is the the um, agricultural uh, uh, superpower in, in, in the world as far as, as, uh, as fr uh, food production is concerned. And by, there's a huge contrast between the agricultural land exist, uh, that's available to China and the land and water and sun that is, are available in, in Brazil. China had attempted to be self-sufficient in food until about 2001. But basically, it has less agricultural land per capita than we have in the United Kingdom. And as a consequence of that, from 2001, it was, it, it was really driven to become more and more dependent on, uh, on Brazil. So you have a land poor country joined up with a land rich country. And China became the dominant uh, 
importer of soya beans and beef, uh, uh, and in fact, at, 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 at about five years ago, and it's actually accelerated very rapidly since, 11 million hectares uh, of land in Brazil have been dedicated to, uh, to China, uh, to, for China soybean in order to feed their pigs. In other words, to uh, su support a transition to greater meat eating in, in China. But there are similar contrasts um, in relation to other countries. So uh, post the disaster of Fukushima, uh, nuclear power station um, disaster, Japan switched a lot in terms of its power generation from nuclear to coal. And it now is, has the dominant partnership between Japan and Australia. So Australia is the biggest coal exporter in the world. And, but Japan import, imports nearly half of its total exports. And that half is equal to the, the total Australian domestic coal consumption. And as I said, as the biggest exporter, it exports 70% Australia of its coal. And then um, perhaps a, a, a thing that surprised me when I found this out was there's a similar kind of partners in climate change, if you like, between the EU and Russia and Kazakhstan. I'd always thought that we got most of our oil from the Middle East, but in fact now the dominant oil companies and dominant imports are coming from, from Russia and Kazakhstan. So 30%, 7% of all, all, all oil imports come from Russia and Kazakhstan into the EU. And conversely, Russian exports are 70% uh, going to, to the EU. And there's a very similar story with Russian, Russian gas. Okay, um, so now uh, I want to look at the consequences of this for, the, for COP26. And this was a, a recent, um, actually was published figures. Uh, I've updated the figures that are in my book even, uh, but it, it's really dealing with essentially the same, uh, same process. So that here these diagrams show for coal, oil and gas, where we are in terms of the, the plans that have been submitted to COP26. This line here, the top orange line in all three diagrams show what their different countries are, have been committing to in their program, in, their, in the development of fossil energy from 2020 up to 2040. The, the second line, the green dotted line, is what would be necessary uh, for achieving a two degree centigrade grade, um, limit to, uh, to climate change. And the bottom blue line shows how, how, what is required for the for 1.5 degrees centigrade. And you can see right across in all of these that they're hopelessly missing the targets in terms of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. And in the first one, it is China and, Dom uh, China and India that dominate. In the second one, the US, Saudi and Russia for oil. And in the third one, US uh, and Russia. In these two, US is the top, uh, is the top producer of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of oil, oil, oil and gas. And you can see from their projections, they are scarcely reducing them at all. So these are where, where we're at in terms of what, the, what has been submitted so far to, uh, to, the, uh, to the COP26. And the recent modeling, which is also referred to in the book, is that there should be, uh, in order to achieve 1.5 degrees centigrade, 58% of all oil, 59% of fossil methane gas, and 89% of coal must not be extracted in order to achieve that goal. And you can see what the issue is there. And then looking at, so that, what's significant about that, that's a natural sciences view of where we are at. However, if you look at the per capita aspect of that, what is even more significant about those, those diagrams I've just shown you is that the US is three times more fossil energy, produces three times more fossil energy emissions per capita than China. And you wouldn't know that from the press coverage of COP26. Of course, it's absolutely critical that China reduces its dependence on coal, but it's equally should be absolutely clear that what's happening in the US is, is a much greater per capita 
per, per capita emission of CO2 from, from its consumption of, uh, of, of coal, oil and gas. So in its projections, certainly it is declining in coal. But if you look at oil, it's scarcely, it's going up and it, it only plateaus roughly at a very high level in 2035 and the similar situation with gas, which continues to go up. And again, as a contrast, again, from a sociogenic point of view, you can see that in India, the per capita coal consumption is one quarter the per capita consumption of coal in Germany. So these are huge inequalities in terms of the command of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of fossil energy and their impact on, on, on the climate, on, on, on climate change. But it isn't only fossil energy. It is also very critically land. So I'm ending this kind of phase of looking at what's happened. And I'm in, ending it with a quotation from Bolsonaro. The Amazon is ours, not yours. In other words, he is saying very clearly, and in fact, he's, you can be outraged by it. Well, I am outraged by it. <laughs> But in fact, what he's saying is not really different from any of the other countries that are saying the same things about their coal, their oil, and their gas. I mean, they're saying, this is ours. This is territorially ours. We have control over it. We are gonna do what we, are, what we intend to do with it. We will submit plans to the COP as far as that's concerned. And it's only Bolsonaro is really so brutal in saying, the Amazon is ours and not yours. And since his election, he has, proclaimed that his aim is to commercialize the use of the, uh, uh, the land of the, of the Amazon. And as you can see that there has been a rocketing up of the level of deforestation uh, within, within the Amazon since he, since he was elected. Okay, so my final slide. Um, I think I've tried to cover in a, both in a historical sense and also in a contemporary sense, the huge societal variation there is and the significance of a sociogenic analysis for understanding what, what the real obstacles are to, a, uh, 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 to coming out of, of, of the climate emergency. And paradoxically, one of the major issues that I think has become evident about it, uh, in, in this analysis is the fact that the United Nations really is misfit for purpose. I mean, it, what's really important to understand is that the United Nations was born out of two catastrophic world wars, wars which had absolutely wrecked the whole of the, of, the, of the globe. And it was formed very largely with an, in, an imperative of, of, of peacekeeping between nations. And in doing that was asserting the, 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 the paradigm of national sovereignty. But what we've just seen in those slides, in particular, the one where I, I showed the, 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 fate, the productive, uh, production gap, it has demonstrated that there is no global solution by produ produced by the sum of all national solutions. So all the promises that they've made, the, uh, which are called the national determined contributions, has been less to, left to each nation to determine what it is going to do to, uh, to uh, address the, the climate emergency. And the result of that has been a, a, an abject failure to, to really uh, come to a, 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 an effective global solution. And that is partly, I think, to be accounted for on the grounds that the rights of nations to exploit their own territorial environmental resources is almost seen as an, an inviolable sovereign right. And yet really what we're faced with is, is in a situation which I was talking about both in terms of the Amazon or in terms of those unexploitable uh, reserves of coal, oil and gas, is that there must be some kind of uh, global and international right to restrict and prevent the exploitation of, of those environmental resources. Because if it, if it isn't, doesn't happen, there will be no resolution of the, of, the, of the climate emergency. And the second major aspect, which is absolutely clear by leaving it for each nation to sort out its own problems with, in relation to climate change, is that it, it, it doesn't even address the issue of the unequal responsibilities for climate change uh, 
between the, the, the highly developed and the less developed uh, e economies, let alone the inequalities that exist within those countries, which are so stark and staggering. And, and uh, so uh, I think I shall only end with this rather kind of bleak reflection on, on, the, um, on, on the situation that we're faced. If it took two catastrophic world wars to really shake up and alter the political institutions, both national and international, in order to kind of preserve peace within the world, to the extent that it has managed to do that. You could ask, you have to ask the question to what extent, what catastro catastrophes are going to be necessary to shake up the political institutions and lead to the kind of uh, resources that are, need, uh, are needed to address this and really involve a wealth distribution of a different kind across the world, both in terms of environmental resources and in terms of, 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 of wealth. There has been a failure, notably to, to even reach the minimal, the minimal proposal for a $100, uh, a billion dollar transfer um, from the rich countries to the developing countries for their green transitions. But without that happening, we're, we cannot really ultimately think that we can solve the climate change uh, emergency by, by leaving half of the world's population in poverty. Thank you. Thank you for that brilliant talk, Mark. That was, um, I think you used the word bleak. It was sobering, but also very galvanizing for the thought that, you know, there was hope in at least confronting these issues, which I don't think I've ever seen presented quite so um, clearly in many ways. So that was really enlightening for me in many ways. I'll turn now to our panelists, and we're going to take the talks from our panelists in alphabetical order, starting with Jeremy Crickler, who joins us from the History Department. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, okay. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, Mark, and uh, you know, thank you for producing uh, something which is so timely and fully in keeping with your uh, your whole intellectual project, which has always been to engage very much with the contemporary concerns of uh, our societies and to help to effect change in them as you did in your work on construction, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, so, um, you know, I obviously the, uh, the, the book is very provocative, I have to say that. It's very um, urgent. Uh, when I finished reading it, I, uh, I turned to, uh, Angelica is my youngest child and said straight away, what, what else can we do to reduce our carbon footprint? Because you, the, the book really is, is urgent. And I uh, hugely appreciated the way in which Mark shows the connections between, uh, for example, uh, the Chinese resource endowment and uh, soy and beef in Brazil or uh, Japan's resource endow endowment and uh, and also uh, Australian coal and, and so on. So, uh, you know, Mark is um, showing in, the, in this book how crucial resource endowments are, but also noting how central uh, political and strategic um, policies are to vaulting resource endowments, you know, imperialism, for example, or the structuring of, of, of trade. So, uh, you know, it's all illuminating in, in, all, those, in all those kinds of ways. Um, provocative as well. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what provoked me was uh, partly the argument regarding e uh, equality. Uh, it's absolutely right, as Mark says, that the historical legacy of the North American and European uh, contribution to the climate catastrophe uh, has to be uh, has to be part of the solution. Uh, at the same time, uh, no matter how much uh, money is provided by the U.S. or the European countries to uh, to poorer countries, there will be no way out of the climate. Uh, catastrophe unless uh, particular decisions are taken in, in Asia. It's quite obvious in terms of carbon uh, 
of CO2 output that whatever Europe or North America does, if the if the uh, carbon if the CO2 output in Asia, so that's China, India, and actually the, the countries apart from China in Asia make a CO2 um, output that is equivalent to, to China's without uh, some kind of massive reduction or, or change there, uh, there's no ways we, we're going to make the, uh, the um, requisite uh, reduction and you know what that what that su suggests is that uh you know a focus on equality unfortunately in a sense isn't going to resolve uh that that problem and uh you know i'd like to hear what what mark uh what mark says says about that i mean for, for example does the uh, diminution in the amazon rainforest mean that chinese people must actually reduce their consumption is that uh, does the does the the fact that um, that Indian people at present are actually uh, having a carbon a, a CO two output that is uh, within the range that Mark says the whole world has to achieve per capita in order for us to meet the one point five degrees uh, target? Uh, what does that what does that say to to Indian people that actually their their consumption mustn't mustn't increase i'm sure mark mark isn't arguing that but it actually does show the very considerable moral questions that are actually raised by uh the the whole climate uh catastrophe and how we ought to get out of it uh the final point that, I, that i'm going to raise is going to be a more hopeful one actually uh and you know mark uh notes in his book the importance of the environmental movement and protests and how crucial they've been for the world taking on the on the issue and obviously central to that has been activism but cent central to that has also been uh, scientists and scientific work and i just going to end what i'm saying as a historian to ask um, is there another example in history where rational inquiry and uh, dissemination of its findings as well as moral critique have led to so massive and general um, a registration of uh, the impending catastrophe and a determination to shift economic life. I mean, the vested interests that have been challenged in this have actually been really immense. Uh, and also the sheer inertia of the existing energy and economic infrastructures that have to be that have to be shifted. Uh, and I'd like to hear how, how that compares with anything historically. Uh, movements to restrict the working day or child labor, the abolition of slavery, for example, you know, these involved major shifts in sensibility and, and so on. Uh, and I just wonder if, ending on the hopeful note, is this the birth uh, of something new, something only glimpsed in the campaigns against nuclear weaponry or you know, a little bit in environmentalism, you know, are we now seeing the birth of a generalized politics around what E.P. Thompson once called the human ecological imperative? Thank you, Jeremy, for those really excellent, compelling remarks. Um, we'll turn now to Nigel South from the Department of Sociology. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. That's really useful for what I want to say, because you're raising some uh, real world uh, moral and political questions, and, and we obviously need both. We need high level analysis, the kinds of questions Mark's raising, but also uh, those real world uh, questions. So, you know, obviously, a great book, important, couldn't be more topical at the moment, nicely written. It's relatively short, but as we'd expect from a Polanyan, it sweeps through history, economic periods, and around the globe. So, you know, it's, it's all there. Uh, it's impossible to consider the entire book, uh, and the book itself can't cover anything. So just two sets of thoughts from the point of view of a, of a green critical criminology. First, around the idea of justice. Um, Mark uses the idea of a just transition and refers to climate justice. Uh, there's a key tension, the key theme in the book uh, about the tension or incompatibility between capitalism and sustainability. Uh, 
because the former is based on a fixation on growth and the possibility of the latter is diminished as a result. But as Mark and others note, the end of capitalism, capitalism is not imminent. So the question is how to bring about uh, drastic climate change mitigation in the immediate time frame. Uh, this transformation from the old planet burning economics must be combined with the creation of a new, more equal world, he says. Uh, and this, he says, has to be a just transition. I'm not a great optimist about the pace of this transformation, but some elements of what need to be done seem to be increasingly familiar. Uh, sustainable agriculture, rewilding and reforestation, elements of the circular economy, recycling, reuse and so on. But whether major changes of norms and routines of consumption are really following from this is less certain, in part because, as Mark says, this requires us to imagine a whole different quality of social life. Now, I think one problem here is one quite central to work at Cressy and particularly Lindsay's idea of strategic ignorance or what Deborah Britzman calls difficult knowledge. We know that at least in some countries and surveyed populations, there's increasing awareness of and anxiety about climate change, but there's still resistance to proposals that would affect quality of life. In a way, resistant publics draw on their own version of distributive justice, i.e. the pains and costs of remedying climate problems should be borne by those who did more to cause these problems, the rich, frequent flyers, Americans, etc. A second way of thinking about uh, justice relevant to the question of how we achieve this just transition might be based on the idea of procedural justice, which could underpin a call for a different, conceivable, but currently unavailable politics. And that would need to be fair and transparent and inclusive in line with SDG 16. And, and Mark kind of talks about this in the book, but from my point of view, I think it would be nice to talk a bit more about the, the ideas, the philosophy, the, the, the practicalities of justice. Uh, my second area of thinking um, takes a little journey back to what Mark was concluding with. Uh, we know the impacts of climate change and responsibility for causes are massively differentiated and unequal. Uh, so I looked at the book index to see what it could tell me about this. It doesn't include two of the populations least responsible for climate change, but most likely to suffer consequences. Uh, and this is part of the danger of looking at indexes, but uh, it doesn't include, there's not an entry for women, and there isn't one for indigenous peoples. Uh, though with regard to the latter, of course, there's a lot on the history and consequences of settler colonialism, and as Jeremy has just said, Mark shows British colonization of slave plantations in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Settler colonialism in North America were crucial points in the sociogenesis journey. Uh, and Castellino writes about this as well nicely. The contemporary climate emergency is directly traceable to colonial activities commenced on indigenous territories, continued under post-colonial regimes with the active support, material and logistic of the former colonial powers. Nor does the index include the word victims, which might be okay because of course to note victim status is also important um, because it can remove, remove um, risk removing agency. Uh, and this is the problem with how indigenous communities have been recognized in climate change agreements, principally in terms of how they are affected uh, by climate change, giving them the status of victims but receiving little or, or less recognition as actors in strategies and, in, and, and efforts to combat uh, climate change. And this is particularly important because the voice and interests of indigenous peoples are central to consideration of one strategy for future sustainability that Mark writes about. He writes, it may be utopian thinking, but the climate emergency brings into question the very concept of a nation state's absolute rights over its territorial environmental resources. This is the Bolsonaro point. A universalization of environmental regulation for planetary sustainability becomes critical for establishing a transition, a transnational public goods commons of those uh, resources. This is a key argument, but the question of course is how to make this work. So let me finish with an illustration of the real world complexity involved. 
On the current available mechanisms, global funding responses are based on the assumption that economically poor countries will reduce CO2 emissions if rich countries provide money and technology. So economically poor countries can see climate change as an economic opportunity. In Ecuador, the Yasuni no-go zone project 2007 to 2013 followed a statement of intent to leave untouched the oil beneath the soil. But the proposal was uh, conditional on international pledges to provide compensation of 3.6 billion US dollars over 13 years. This was applauded by many green groups and Hollywood stars and, and others, but actually the underpinning narrative saw climate change as an economic and an equity problem and less as an environmental problem, partly because the land is indigenous land. When the funding flow did not match expectations, the project was ended and the equity narrative was uh, invoked. So that's about what a country must do to remedy the problem depends on how much that country has contributed to causing it. So when the project ended, the president said, the world has failed us, called the world's richest countries hypocrites because they're the main cause of greenhouse gases, and then turned back to oil extraction with a legitimized mandate and severe consequences for the Amazon environment and indigenous communities. So this is a complex case with this very simple idea at its heart, and <clears throat> the model may be workable, and the model may be just, but as Mark, I think, knows, the path to agreement about this, the universalization of environmental regulation, is going to be a really difficult one, partly because, as Jeremy said, of real-world moral and political problems. That's it. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for those, um, again, extremely compelling and important remarks. And I think, you know, Nigel was a bit too modest to mention, but he's been involved with the framing of um, legal actions around eco ecocide. So I did wonder how Nigel's work on ecocide fit with Mark's very important remarks at the end about the inadequacies of the UN system for tackling some of the challenges we fit. So maybe that's something Mark will also come back to. And now we turn to Katie Wheeler, who's been at the forefront of really work in the department and the university on climate change, as well as through her work as a co-convener of the BSA Climate Change Group. So over to you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks, Mark, for your talk and for um, inviting me to this um, discussion. OK, so I've got um, a few kind of general comments, praise, and then I've got a couple of questions. OK, um, so. Mark's book represents the joining together of his neo planning framework with an urgent call for sociology to pay proper attention to the environment within their accounts of societal change and transformation. The book highlights the absence of the environment from even Marxist accounts and develops this concept of the unique and interconnected resource environment which mediates what actions and paths are set in motion when political economies interact with distinctive reserves of land, crops, water, energy. I think the book is really ambitious in scope and scale, um, moving us from very local choice um, to consume meat to international trade relations of um, animal and plant agriculture between countries which produce and distribute food within this system. The historical and contemporary comparative lens shows us why a social scientific perspective is essential to understand the true scope and complexity of the climate emergency. The externalisation of environment from the economy can no longer continue, and I think the careful analysis in this book highlights um, the ineffectiveness of viewing carbon emissions through a national scale. Globalisation connects us through dynamic cycles of production, distribution, exchange and consumption, which reproduce and perpetuate historical inequalities with a lens on societal variations between those dimensions. Um, and in my own work on education for sustainability, I can really see how a sociogenesis perspective represents an example of exactly the sort of critical and systems thinking that we that is needed to help us understand how technical and social worlds interact. Young people and activists like Greta Thunberg are right to call their, um, their education in the field of sustainability as not fit for purpose. But the sorts of arguments presented in this book show how history, politics and science must be brought into conversation in a truly interdisciplinary way. Something that's incredibly challenging when our education systems are built on disciplinarity and, and difference. 
And I can imagine that researching for this, this book must have led Mark to explore natural science um, explanations for the changing climate, which would have involved learning lots of new concepts and ideas, which, you know, are, are unfamiliar to many social scientists. You know, it's just, the scale of the challenge is a shared and collective responsibility that but the social and natural scientists need to find ways to research together. And I think that's an area that, you know, this book kind of shows um, why that's so important. So it goes without saying that um, I, I read Mark's book with much interest and strongly support his sociogenesis perspective. A few questions um, remain for me and things that I'd like to push Mark to talk, talk a bit further about, obviously not maybe not to find the solution to, but um, for us to, 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 to discuss. So um, as a sociologist of sustainable consumption, um, I welcome the claim that consumers are embedded within their energy dependent practices and are potentially locked in to particular energy um, demand configurations because of decisions that have been made at the level of the state national economy. And I think it's absolutely right that he demands us to stop placing the blame for climate change at the hand of consumers who are getting on with their daily lives. But um, for too long, individual behaviour change has been at the heart of policy discussions around sustainability transitions, coupled with technological innovation um, as well. Um, but as supportive as I am of that position, I do wonder what role consumers or citizens should be playing within climate change debates and actions. Um, at times in the book, the wide angle lens means it's quite difficult to imagine how we as individuals can and should make a difference. So often when you talk to people who are faced with environmental destruction, there is a real desire to, to do something and a moral imperative to act. And you know, participation in things like recycling schemes and eco-labeling eco -labeling are understood by many as a way of making a difference. So whilst we might question the effectiveness of such actions, I think the political potential of such com um, commitment represents something that we shouldn't dismiss necessarily. Not to say that there can be a universal consumer politics that, that might be even possible or desirable, but how can we harness that sociogenic perspective to engage and educate consumers as citizens and what sorts of political mobilization might result from that? Okay, then my, my second question relates to the role of voluntary initiatives that seek to regulate markets. So um, Mark talked about in chapter four when he was exploring the um, Brazil, China um, and soy beef dynamic, he talks about initiatives like the soy um, moratorium, which was an, a partnership between NGOs um, and, and businesses, which actually um, he highlighted as being something that actually did have some very real effects in terms of you know the regulation of, of, of the market and I think how does that uh, how how can we imagine these kind of initiatives alongside um, the the conclusion that we need like stronger state action and international action on this arena so how far how can we how can we pull these different ideas together but given the distinctive political economies that are developing and the role of the moral imperative often demanded for on the part of citizens and consumers and this might be like the connection between my two points here what role can and should international business in partnership with NGO perhaps um, schemes play within climate reduction strategies of course there is no one size fits all and the solution um, at one size fits all solution. And as we've seen that, obviously he makes that point quite clearly in the book, but can a system which is based on capital domination of environmental resources be championed as a potentially successful way of making a difference? And if so, what does that mean for democratic modes of governance and regulation? <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, Mark, there's been only one question so far in the chat and it's, will there be a signing? at the bookstore. So I think that is a crucial question, but I think as some other, so maybe you could address that and answer that. And then one attendee has raised their hand. It, it is easier if people actually write out their questions rather than raising their hands if possible. And while you are doing so, maybe Mark, you could begin to respond to, say a few words in response to some of these questions from the panelists that were very compelling, looking at morality, justice, and sort of feasibility of different policy options. So do you want to start, Mark, and then we'll start collecting some questions? Well, well first of all, to thank all, all three of you for some very uh, important questions. I, and I, I really, um, I, don't, I don't have um, any, uh, <laughs> any kind of uh, quarrel with any of the kind of points that you're making and, 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 uh, and uh, would um, support them. I mean, 
In turn, the equality issue that Jeremy raised, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, absolutely agree that there is no way forward if uh, Indonesia, um, India and, and, and China are going to burn all the coal that they've got. I mean, that, that's, that's going to, that would be catastrophe. If everybody even did everything that they should do apart from that, that would still be a catastrophe. I mean, what it does point to, though, is um, that there has to be a different, a very radically different mode of, of, of development and, and wealth distribution as a process of development than the one that we've seen in the West and, and, and the advanced economies. And, and that's a huge, a huge issue that's, that's in, involved. I mean, in relation, I, I mean, I think it's, it, it's just wrong and impossible for us to say to Chinese people, you shouldn't eat meat. I mean, how can we say that when we're eating twice as three times more meat than they are? I mean, it, it's just a, not a position that one can take. Uh, but what one can take is uh, what kind of strategies that there might be for, for dealing with that uh, um, and having some kind of common, uh, common perspective about that. And having said that, the Chinese have actually introduced a meat cap in terms of per capita consumption, which is pretty pretty unique, I think, in term, across the world. I can't think of any any other country that's done that. But but there, when I ended by saying that we can't resolve the climate change uh, issue by keeping half the world's population in poverty, I, I, I mean, I really do mean that. Um, and and what that means is that there has to be a really, really radical view about wealth wealth distribution, and, and this comes back to the point that I think that Nigel was uh, saying about the justice, uh, the international justice in terms of rights to the environmental resources of the planet. And um, I'm not, I just haven't got the knowledge to, to know how those those systems of justice can be developed. I, I, I mean, I, I refer I wrote a piece in Discover Society where I, I, I talked about um, some of the those things like the right to protect, which the is is uh, uh, the right, to, which is which is a supranational power of the United Nations to intervene in the case where a population, a part of a population, is like subject to uh, genocide, and and you could look upon the similar issue in terms of ecocide. But we're, we're a long way from having got the, um, an equivalent in terms of the planet for, um, for, the, for, for the International uh, Court on, on Crimes Against Humanity. But in a sense, I mean, in, I, I do think that there has to be uh, the development of a justice system that, that deals with those kind of ecological, ecological questions. I think it's a very, very important dimension to, to think of in terms of, but I mean, to be honest, it's it's really outside my field of field of expertise. So I I don't know I don't know the I haven't got a route map for how to get there at, uh, uh, get there at all. Um, okay, thanks, Mike. To... There's a few other questions that have have come in. Shall we Shall we take these and then we've got a question from Dimitri. What educational approach should HE adopt to address the urgent environmental challenges without wanting to perpetuate? The current economic system, which relates to um, Katie's questions. Felix, if you, and then I'd like to, uh, to turn to Felix afterwards, but Felix, I will try now to make you a, a co-panelist so that you can speak yourself if you wish, or you can type it, but I'll do that now. And then as, before we go to Felix, I wasn't sure if Nigel wanted to respond to any of Mark's um, last helpful remarks on ecocide. Um, if not, we'll, we'll keep taking questions, but the panelists should feel free to come in when they like. With points that they have? Uh, well, only to similarly say I don't have a route map either. I mean, part of the campaign around ecocide has been to be provocative. Uh, it, would, it would require in the original um, campaign recourse to um, something like the International Criminal Court, but the United States and others don't recognise the ICC. So, yeah, um, yeah. You, you know, you've got a problem right from the start if there isn't, as you say, an international body that is signed up to. Um, so in part it's a political argument about keep saying we need something like this um, and, and in part it is 
that we've got to have hope that eventually we can get to something like that. But uh, I don't have the route map either. So, Felix, did you want to ask your question or Mark, did you, maybe we can take Felix's question and that might, and then Mark, you could respond to that. Um, and, uh, can, you, can you repeat the question that you asked before? I, uh, uh, it was on higher education strategies. Yeah. And it, so I think it speaks as well to Katie's point on interdisciplinarity. It, well, um, I, 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 I obviously think that there needs to be a, um, uh, a almost a, like a reconfiguration of, nat of, of natural and social sciences, uh, sciences working around these issues. And, but also, um, I, I mean, I, sometimes, I mean, you could, somebody, somebody could have said, you know, my whole thing with that slide about how societies are, are, are cited in, in their resource environments or the ones that they, acquire control over the through colonization or trade, they would turn around and say, you're a geographer. <laughs> um, and, um, and, it, and it's true that there, obviously that does involve a kind of geographical, nationally a spatial and temporal dimension. So I, I, do, I do think climate change asks some pretty important mm -hmm. questions about the, the, the kind of disciplinarities that we have and the, and, uh, and, and the boundaries that, that exist at the, at the moment. At the moment. Um, and and that would that would obviously mean it, it goes all the way through in terms of uh, uh, curricula and and I would add to, in relation to uh, <laughs> Nigel's critique of my index <laughs> um, that uh, of, of of course it must given the kind of account that I've I've. I've, I have of the of sociogenesis of climate change. It involves a decolonization of the of uh, of the of the of the curriculum as well. Because, I, I mean, well, I, I shouldn't really sort of exaggerate this, but you you can read histories of the industrial revolution in the Britain without realizing that there were the slave plantations in the U.S. I mean, uh, the the connection between wage labor and slavery is is one that is is not been strongly made <laughs> and yet you can't understand either sociogenesis of climate change in the industrial revolution um or or the development of industrial capitalism in the uk without under without it being absolutely tied into colonization and and and, and genocides and ethnic cleansings within within the us so so i, I would um I would completely endorse the fact that it, it it really does pose some very significant higher educational issues. I think. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Felix. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I would like to. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, um, uh, yeah, you know, for th this book and uh, the analysis uh, you you did. I mean, um, I, I would like to, to, to ask a question, you know, very much from, rather from a historical point of view, because as a matter of fact, a lot of what you did refers, I mean, you have a certain historical dimension there, yeah, but a lot of it is of course an analysis of the more of the present and the more recent past. But isn't it true uh, that if we take you know, all the uh, human-induced um, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, that almost 90% of them uh, were caused by North America or Europe historically, because you know, uh, we have the Industrial Revolution in, in, in Europe beginning almost with the 18th century. And for a very long time, the main producers of CO2 were Europeans and North Americans. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I wonder whether this would not make um, the, uh, the point much stronger that uh, Northern America and Europe should really take the initiative and go forward um, because a lot of the, the situation we in right we are in right now actually I would say is in terms of historical responsibility very much a European and North American thing. I'm saying this also because 
um, rather recently, I, I started a, a kind of an intellectual self-experiment. I tried, I mean, I know that's sort of silly and, and naive, but I tried to see the world uh, uh, today's from a Chinese or Indian perspective. Mm. Yeah, of course, an imagined one. Yeah, and um, actually, uh, I think it's not enough if we just analyze the situation as it is right now, especially if we talk about justice. I think there's also a historical dimension of justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this would make a strong argument. Yeah, literally, I mean, I know that's probably also naive yeah, to, talk, to, to expect the Americans, the Europeans to say, okay, we take the lead yeah, and um, we take decisive steps. You follow suit, as you see fit, maybe. Yeah, but you know, for reasons literally of historical justice or historical sense of justice. So yeah, that's just you know my my thought, and um, yeah, you know, I, I think implicitly I asked a, a question, <laughs> more questions. I would just uh, know what you think uh, about that. Thank well, I, I just I, I just completely agree, and in fact, I think that is one of the things that I try to argue. Really, that uh, I mean, I thought that the actual presentation that I I gave today was could have been seen as U.S. bashing um, because I <laughs> I really put um, the U.S. in in the frame. But I I I, I, I really I, I think it's in terms of the the kind of current discourse that you see on. You know all the news programs that are going on about COP COP26. They do deflect the attention of the historical legacy of of the the US and 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 the British and the British in terms of the, their development and to where they have arrived, where, what position that they hold now. So there is, there is a, I mean, not, there obviously is an issue of historical justice there. Uh, absolutely no question whatsoever. So and um, and I. And I, I believe that um, obviously that that means that uh, I mean the Indians recently said, look, uh, they made this statement. I mean it, Modi and so on because they essentially want to go on burning their coal. That in order to be, for them to do that, uh, the, you, the U.S. and 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 Europe should go into position of negative um, uh, CO2. So they should be carbon capturing rather than carbon uh, rather than net zero. They need to go. Uh, they need to go negative. And, and um, while <laughs> while that's most unlikely to happen, uh, I mean, I, I certainly think that um, the, the 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 U.S. and 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 Europe bear the uh, the major burden of 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 bringing about uh, a climate change but then you you know you see the politics in the us at the moment one democratic senator senator minchin sitting on top of the appalachian coal fields is preventing biden's program for uh, a, a greening of the economy taking place so it's a it's a it's a, a desperate situation really in that respect Jeremy, did you want to add and speak yes, to your I, I remarks? Yes, I mean, I, you know, I completely agree. And I think most of the charts that are readily available show the North American and European uh, historic responsibility for most CO2 output. There's no question of, uh, about that. At the same time, um, North American and European CO2 output is falling. And the climate crisis is, you know, impending and con and 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 continuing. And I, whilst that's I, not true. That's not. I mean, those. Well, sides... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mark. But if you look at at the CO2 output in world in data, you'll see that generally, uh, European and North and uh, I'll show to you afterwards. But the the point is, is that um, I I do think there is a problem if we uh, simply. Uh, deflect the absolutely necessary reductions that do have to take place in in coal use elsewhere on the basis of a, an argument about historic responsibility yes money obviously has to be has to be provided uh, and the you know the 
that that bill should be footed disproportionately by Europe and North and North uh, uh, America. But it's not going to get away from the point that you made that unless decisions are made, whatever Manchin decides in the in the US, it's much more important what's decided in China uh, now. And I th I think that's uh, you know that's something we shouldn't lose lose sight of. The other point that I do think is is somewhat uh, missing from, from Mark's book is that uh, the CO2 output historically uh, has also been driven by state projects of national rivalry with, with uh, its great, great power rivalry. Industrialization by Germany or France or, or other places or the US was also very, very much a competitive industrialization against, for example, uh, Britain, and uh, the to you know to give us a sense of what we're up against, it's not merely uh, you know vested interests uh, that we know about of 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 uh, capital. One of the the reasons I'm sure that the the Communist Party uh, government in China insists on delaying the reduction in the use of coal has got to do with a competitive rivalry with the USA mm -hmm. and its determination to be uh, you know the 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 primary su superpower is is also part of this the story and uh, there's there's not going to be you know that that actually has to be has to be conceded and I don't think it's it's such it's such a I think it's, it's it's a good thing that there should be a moral critique of North American and European responsibility, which is colossal. I also don't think it's a it's it's a bad thing for there to be an, an international moral critique of the present policies of the Chinese uh, communist government. I mean, that that actually is as important as as the other. I think, uh, you know. I'd like to hear what Mark thinks about that. Well, I, I, I have absolutely, I, I think I've already made it very clear, and I certainly think I made it clear in, in, in the book that uh, China's coal has, has to not be extracted. If it's extracted, we're in catast catastrophe situation. And therefore, it is absolutely central uh, that, 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 that there is a... Uh, a shift, a shift in, 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 in policy within, within China. And I, I mean, I go along completely with your idea of great power rivalry and, and, and so on. And it is obviously very important that China is in, with, with its burning of coal, and this is the link that is not always made sufficiently enough, the consumption of Chinese goods in, in, you've got to have a production consumption link. I mean, who is consuming the goods that are produced in China? A lot of them are being consumed by the people who purchase them in the, in, in, in the US or in Europe and so on and so forth. And, and, and those, when I talk about partnerships in, uh, in, in climate change, we've got always see the production consumption links that there are in, 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 in these things. Mm -hmm. So I don't, think it's, I, don't think, I don't think much is served by trying to point the finger in one direction or the mm -hmm. other. I mean, I think, it, uh, I think there is, we might disagree to the extent of, of the balance that there is to be uh, of responsibilities, uh, but there is, uh, I, I, if I say that, you know, US has got three times the uh, per capita emissions of CO2 than, than, than in China, that means to me not that China is off the hook by any means, but it does mean that there is an apportionment of responsibility uh, in terms of reductions in terms of reductions of, of, of CO, CO2 um, emissions. So, um, yeah, I mean, the world is going to lose certainly if we if we if we uh, st start um, blaming others to exonerate. Uh, uh, some we've got to, it's 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 a it's, it's a global it's a global issue in, in which there's got to be uh, uh, well most importantly you've got to stop the, the the fossil energy from being extracted the stranded assets have got to be found some kind of international way of preventing them from ever being uh, uh, consumed and produced and uh, and you've got to think about land in the same way the Amazon mm -hmm. the, the rainforests uh, and, and so on so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, 
do I have a finger to point at Bolsonaro for burning up the Amazon? Of course I do. And of course, uh, um, uh, uh, that doesn't, the fact that I'm saying what I say about, um, about the US doesn't in any way diminish that, that accusing finger that I'm pointing at Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very helpful response, I think, and it just speaks to the problem, too, of national responsibility being an insufficient lens for talking about internal stratifications of power that can be then deflected by people like Modi or Bolsonaro when we talk about historical injustice in pr too broad a way. So, yes, we need to look at historical just injustice and take Felix's very good point about coloniality and power imbalances. But then when we take that, adopt that lens, it can then give ammunition to someone like Modi to weaponize that injustice in order to say, I don't have to do anything in mm -hmm. essence, and to really shore up a power base internally when he does so. So, so I think Mark's point is very good. Avoiding that finger blame uh, avoids giving that power to someone like Modi, I think potentially. So Jane, I'd like to call on you next. Um, and then we have one final question um, has come in after Jane. So maybe we can take these together and then give the last word over to Mark and any panelists who have any last remarks, which is a great question about our friend, Bill Gates. So first Jane, and then the question in the chat on Bill Gates after. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks very much to Mark and the panelists for a great discussion and uh, I look forward to reading the book, Mark. I haven't had time yet, but uh, um, yeah, I had. I, one of the things that strikes me is that there was a period between 1992 and 2008 when there were a lot of proposals around the just transition of, um, and even the this precedent of the historic polluters. Uh, reducing emissions first was, say, embedded in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and, but there are also a lot of civil society proposals and discussions around this very knotty problem of, you know, how do you get out of this kind of stalemate where developing countries are saying, no, we're going to burn our coal because, uh, you know, you have already done that. Um, and I wondered if you'd looked at some of those debates and thought about how um, we could build upon some of those precedents, because in, effectively we've had 10 years of um, backlash where many of these proposals have really disappeared from public debate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the sort of neoliberal fossil fuel backlash after Copenhagen. Um, so I just wondered if, you know, it's worth going back to some of those and thinking about how and whether you looked at some of the, you know, cap and trade and, and so on um, when, you, when you were writing the book, or if you'd looked at, um, in, at the sort of national level, there's the case of the Scottish Just Transition Commission, which is doing very interesting work on um, ensuring a transition which allows for labour transfer from high polluting industries and so on. So, I mean, obviously in one short book, you're not gonna cover everything, but I just would like your thoughts on this and whether um, some of these ideas really, the time has come. And I think the, the protest, there's been a major shift in the media coverage from the, oh, here's a climate change, um, scientists to a denier to you know blanket coverage now but the challenge I think that you've pointed out is this the nuance of the debates and this international dimension so I wonder if these kind of issues um, or proposals would be useful. Um, well uh, the quick answer to that is that I didn't look at some of those uh, debates I did have a, I did have a look at uh, and I published a, a short piece in, in Discover Society where I looked at the at what had happened from um, across the different cops uh, from uh, from uh, Kyoto, Copenhagen, um, Spain, Madrid, and so on. Um, and I and the and and different kind of responses from political scientists, uh, political scientists, uh, some who thought that the Paris um, 
2015 was was a, a huge step forward because it laid the responsibility uh, to independently to nation states but there's no enforcement mechanism there, there's very little monitoring and so on <clears throat> so there's obviously a big discussion there which i, I i'm I, I haven't really uh gone into it i mean i did look at uh, sort of uh i mean going back to jeremy's point i, I mean i i do think there that there are <clears throat> there is a, a, a an emergence of um green activism of one kind or another and it is very widespread and 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 one can only hope that it will have um an effect and obviously there are um, the, the formation of green new deals is a, is is another very important kind of aspect but it, it so far green new deals have been pretty well uh, confined to um europe and 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 the the us and europe is the only one that is in any sense of transnational green new deal they're all other otherwise sort of they're dealing with their own uh back uh, back backyard kind of thing um so that uh, i mean that's certainly an area to to explore uh jane so and thank you for that comment okay thank you Thanks, Mark. And so we've got one final question in the chat that I will read out. And then I think in the interest of time, we will just go back to Mark for the for the final word, but with, you know, a very warm thank you to the incredibly compelling and really, I think, careful and considerate remarks from the panelists who just sometimes these sort of book launches can be a little bit fawning without adequate challenge. And I think, yes, there was praise, but there was also the biggest token of respect any author can have, which was a challenge to, to the arguments to push Mark, you know, one of our leading thinkers on this to take us even further because there's such an urgency to do so in thinking about proposals. So a huge thank you to the panelists who clearly took this brief very seriously and offered very, I think, compelling and important remarks on Mark's book. So the final question is, I am just reading Bill Gates's book about that, the climate disaster. He mentioned billions were spent to avoid climate disaster by his foundation. Of course he did. He doesn't miss a chance for self-promotion, does he, that guy? However, I already saw many problems that you mentioned in this presentation. Should we trust him or all of his words? So I think it's an important question. And also, I mean, Gates is the technological solutionist, right? Mm -hmm. And he is pitted. I've read, I've read parts of the books, too, that I could stomach uh, his latest book. He's pitting himself against degrowth movements, in essence by also saying we can't deny developing regions their chance to develop economically, which of course affords really the perpetuation of the economic system that he defends. So Mark, how do you respond to the sort of Gates solutionism to these questions? Uh, well, I haven't read the book and I don't know exactly what it, but I can, I can imagine what kind of, uh, what, 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 what he might be, what he might be saying. And, um, the self praise that he's uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's really quite skilled at. Um, I mean, in 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 some ways, you. I mean, obviously, uh, any. Well, can I ask then? Where do you stand on degrowth? What's your views in general about degrowth initiatives? Are they possible or not worth even considering? I I I think well I think. Degrowth, as a kind of general conception, um, uh, doesn't deal with, I think, with the central issue that we've been dealing with: China, India, um, uh, uh, Africa, etc. Et um, and 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 so, I mean, as a kind of, um, I mean, ov obviously, obviously, there, uh, it's in a way, under, it underpins a kind of um, a perspective on. Uh, on capitalism as a kind of uh, a, a monster out of control that will destroy the planet, uh, etc., and that that whole that characteristic of capital accumulation has got to be brought to a stop. Um, it's uh, well, I mean, it's it's a big it's a big question to ask about degrowth, and uh, I, um, and uh, I'm, I, again, I've read some quite quite a bit of stuff uh, um, in the in the recent past, but. Um, I uh, one just wonders whether what kind of political legs it's got. I mean, uh, and and what kind of um, uh, what kind of movement it, it, it could generate. Um, 
And I, I should really have answered um, Casey's question about consumer activism, because I think that is a really, really big, a big issue. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and you, Casey, you um, switched between citizens and consumers quite, <laughs> quite uh, and I think, in fact, that's the, I, I think that's the way to go. I mean, uh, it, it is to think of uh, what are the roles of, um, of, of consumers as, uh, as citizens uh, as against uh, their individual purchasing practices um, uh, 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 and so on. And um, of course, that doesn't mean, um, you know, that, uh, uh, well, I, I could say that, you know, I've got solar panels and a hybrid e car or things like that there, which, which are a result of completely, to my mind, skewed pro uh, subsidize state subsidies of richer people and that's not the way to go in order to to deal with that consumption side of who has solar panels or who has electric cars or who has heat pumps or uh, uh, i mean it, it does require a very very different kind of politics a redistributive politics rather than rather than the kind of politics that uh, that have, uh, uh, have um have, have been uh, have been promoted so far by by this uh, lunatic government that we've got at the moment. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, this I'm sure people will be reaching out for your book in droves, and it's been a real pleasure and an honor for Cressy, the center that you founded, of course, and still play an immense part of, to be part of host, uh, hosting a launch here at Essex. So do rush out and get Mark's book. <laughs> Tell us what you think. Tell us what other panels you might like to see on this topic, because Cressy is very devoted to continuing to host dialogues on this crucial topic that Mark is at the forefront of helping to try to create solutions to, as are many of our other panelists today. So, you know, thank you to them. Thank you to pleasure. them. Thank you to them. Thank you. Thank you for the time you took and to all of you for coming. And um, it was not bleak, Mark. It was inspiring to be galvanized again to confront these issues. So thank you so much to you, Mark, and to all the panelists. A thank huge you. Thank, thank you for you. all thank the you, time Mark. you invested. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Have a good night, all. Thank you. Oh, thanks.